First one is an ASPRO scheme. You've heard Steve mention the word ASPRO. It's Asset Protection and Optimization Team. So this is talking about projects where you're not working direct for network rail, you're perhaps building next to network rail infrastructure. And it's just a little case study of what you might expect, what you need to allow for, and what you need to be thinking about, really. There is guidance out there, but it's not necessarily that much guidance out there on, on what you can expect if you're working on an ASPRO scheme. So. This is a new block of fats being built uh, in East London in Ilford. And we were engaged to do temporary works engineering and, and provide CRE role on the scheme and assist the team who weren't particularly experienced in uh, working with network rail. So the key thing to start with is think about what you're doing. So we're trying to build, I think it's a 13 story structure next to the railway uh, and all the things that that and all the threats that poses to the railway and what network rail are going to want to see to safeguard the rail. So the starting point for a scheme like this is to get uh, what we call a BAPA in place, which is a basic asset protection agreement. It's a legal agreement with network rail that allows them to spend a pot of money to review the designs you're submitting, provide appropriate supervision. If you need to track possessions, all the rules. Uh, access all these sorts of things but it's a it's a legal agreement you as a developer will need to to take with network rail that will have a sum of money attached to it attached to it for network rail staff to spend time looking at your scheme now for them to understand what's required in the BAP and the potential for possessions etc they're going to want to understand what you're doing and how you're going to do it so the starting point is to either get a meeting or to send a document explaining the the um, concept of the scheme, how it's going to be built and the clearances to the railway. That's that's the key consideration. So this scheme here, uh, the railway actually ran in a cutting. You had masonry retaining walls here, uh, a, a small embankment, and then the network rail boundary was here. Uh, and then they're building this 13 storey structure. The blue there indicates the scaffold that was to be erected. And in plan, it looks something like that. You see, there's actually a cut back or a step back in the retaining wall where a signal sat, uh, which was probably the closest asset other than the fence uh, and the OLE gantry. They were the two closest actual network rail assets. So it's not just the railway or the, the running lines you have to worry about. It's everything that belongs to the network rail from the fence to the gantry to signaling assets. All of these things need to be considered. Um, if the designer who's designed the building doesn't have experience of working with network rail, they might well not recognise the hazards or they might recognise the obvious hazards like the railway itself and the OLE. There's lots of other things to think about when you're working next to the railway. Uh, a major one being the OLE clearance. Uh, the 2.75 metres is really the, the zone you have to stay outside of. Um, the further away from that, the better. So if you're looking at this structure here, they've maximized the amount of space, but still left what was a reasonable clearance to the OLE. Um, the track support zone, so that is, this is out of the constructability guidance. So this is considering the area of the ground that network route deemed to support the actual running lines themselves. Uh, and this line continues on in the current guidance to infinity should we say or to to however far down that you don't need to worry about it so you need to consider and make sure you're outside of that zone of influence or you have to demonstrate that you're not going to affect that zone of influence underneath the running lines themselves uh, you also need to look at in this case the retaining wall and demonstrate that you're not loading it or you're not changing the loading on it uh, land ownership might seem like an obvious one but can often be overlooked the Fence lines move over time. There's all sorts of things I've seen with ASPRO schemes where the network rail boundary isn't quite where you think it is. So you need to be engaging at an early stage to, to get that information from them. Um, drainage is a key consideration for the railway. We've seen there from Steve's presentation of failure of a temporary drainage condition leading to potential failure on the railway. Uh, last year, was it the year before the, the railway in Aberdeen where drainage failed that led to the um, a train derailing and actually led to fatalities. It's a serious consideration for the railways, making sure that your um, development is not going to lead to additional water running onto their railway. You've got to risk assess the potential for 
people come into contact with the OLE or the trains themselves. So in this case here, um, what's not apparent is this balcony where it's close to the railway is not for free access to the public. It's, it's a maintenance area. Things, uh, there are balconies on the back of the structure. The lower ones of those have been changed. So they're not open edged or open faced. So if there's children playing or teenagers messing around, they can't actually end up interfacing with the OLE or the OLE structure with fishing rods or whatever else they might play around with. All these things need to be thought about and considered uh, when you're working near a railway in particular one with OLE. OLE, sorry, I should explain that for those who don't know that that's been the conductor here is what I'm talking about. Is the, is the, um, that's the OLE. What you need to think of as the OLE. You also need to consider the temporary works and there's lots and lots of guidance around some of which Steve's been through today. Uh, all of these, I think you mentioned apart from tower crane one, I think, um, guidance in here that sets out what is expected when you're working near the railway. So tower cranes, for instance, need to be down rated. You have to upgrade the foundation design, piling platforms for piling rigs. Again, you need to be upgrading the design to um, ensure the platform's robust, all sorts on testing that's required in there. You've got things about, think about things like mobile cranes, can they fall on the railway? If so, you need to be upgrading the foundation design again. Scaffolds on this structure, we had a scaffold going up the rear of the structure. So you have to consider how that will be built and particularly how can it be constructed and maintain safe clearance to the OLE at all times. Got to consider the network rail assets as I've mentioned. In this case, it wasn't applicable, but it can be. It's signal sighting. Obviously, you can't impact the signals. You have to make sure that the, the signals are never obstructed by works you are undertaking and undertake a signal sighting. Um, not inspection, but the right word. Assessment. Uh, assessment. That's the word I'm looking for, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> to, um, to demonstrate that you're not going to affect the signals. Again, there's the track. The movement of in the track support zone so if you're putting in temporary piles or similar you need to demonstrate that you're not affecting the track support zone or you're not going to lead to failure of the track support zone and then if you are you need to then follow the, the appropriate guidance on levels of track monitoring required uh, which is quite possible if you're working in close proximity to the railway that you will have to monitor the track I haven't come back a page, you know. Hoists again, hoists up the back of the structure. You need to be looking at how they're going to be constructed, how you're going to ensure that um, you're not in, going to impact the railway, you can't impact the railway. The best bet being to move the hoists away from the facade, which is adjacent to the railway. That's the best bet. That way it can't fall on the railway. Uh, the demolition works to clear the site at the beginning. That needs to be considered. Can it impact the railway? How are you going to safeguard the railway? Well, I've kind of been through excavations, but again, consider are you getting into the track support zone or are you going to affect a cutting or a embankment? Again, there's plenty of guidance available. Things like the fences. If you're going to excavate near the network rail fence, how are you going to maintain that fence while you're doing the works? All of these things need to be seriously considered. So I'm just going to pick out a few items here that were submitted to network rail and approvals that were gained to, to allow the site to be constructed. So the site was very restricted um, and the only place they could put the attenuation tank was the rear of the site adjacent to network rail boundary. Not ideal, but there really wasn't anywhere else on the site to do it. Uh, so the permanent works themselves were beefed up and the full um, maintenance schemes put in place and that was all approved by network rail or approved or was sent to network rail so they could see the safeguards being put in place and the construction of this uh, the attenuation tank itself these the ground the um, trench sheets were installed and became sacrificial as normally you would maybe try and pull those back out these were put in as a push and dig operation and uh, using small excavators to, again, to safeguard the railway as far as possible. And by putting the sheets in uh, and not taking them back out again, you're not going to disturb the retaining wall. This section here is actually the worst case where I noted earlier where the wall stepped out around the signal. Typically, the, the retaining wall was over here. So you had generally had a lot of clearance. There was only a small area where we were this tight to the wall. But with the safeguards that put in place, the working methodology, et cetera, 
um, that were allowed us to proceed with the with the proposal. Tower crane itself, you've got to be thinking about the load factors already been through. So down rating seventy five percent, up rating the foundations by one point three three read the guidance on where that applies. It's not just a blanket math multiply by 1.33, read the guidance. You've got to think about where the, the crane can weather vane um, and, and make sure it's outside of network house boundary. Or again, you'll be looking to get air access rights from network route, uh, which all takes additional time. And the earlier you can discuss these things with network route, the better. It might be you're forced down the route for possession when you're erecting the tower crane. It all depends on the perceived risks of the operation. Similarly for the mobile crane, in this case, for putting a tower crane up, or if you're using it generally on the site, you need to be uprating your foundations, need to be considering your collapse radius. If you get within four meters of network rail boundary, then you need to be discussing it with network rail. Again, the earlier you can discuss these things, the better, because you might have to go down the possession route for using the mobile crane. It all depends on what's um, accepted by network rail. And you will find that you'll be looking at increased level of checking for the temporary works and the permanent works actually in in a lot of cases what might be a cat 2 check they may well insist becomes a cat 3 check uh, so again allowing for all of this when you're programming your works is definitely advisable Piling platform again look at the guidance in this case the design load was factored up we did an awful lot more si to uh, understand the ground conditions on site and on top of the finished pilot platform to demonstrate that it was acceptable and a lot of time was spent on the method statements and network rail supervision on site to make sure the guys were working in accordance with the um, agreed method statement from the very outset this project was designed such that the pilot rig would never have to place a surcharge on the network rail retaining wall which made a big difference. If we if we if they tried to push the, the boundary of the project out further and you ended up surcharging this retainable, it was just it, you it could have added months and months, if not years, onto the program to, to get the approvals required for surcharging that wall because you would have to get SI on the walls, you'd have to get more SI on the soils adjacent to the wall. All of these things take time and uh, the best bet is to look at it in an early stage and avoid it which is what happened here when the permanent works engineer designed the scheme they avoided surcharging the walls in the first place okay. um uh the scaffold again there was a cat three check on the scaffold that could fall on the railway uh which was the one to the rear facade consideration given to the ole itself and one that doesn't often get picked up is a formal design of the foundations for um the scaffolds themselves should be done uh, in this case we were loading the structure along the majority of it um so we did an assessment of the structure and provided back problem where required where it was on the ground we designed scaffold foundations to suit the ground conditions that have been established from the pilot platform so a conclusion for that um now plenty of time to get the BAPA. it can take a considerable amount of time for that process um, you need to be programming for the network rail approval process that's not just the first 20 day review it's then once you make changes they request allowing for that time again uh, consider the fact there'll be additional checking required think about a risk assessing the permanent works properly uh, with due consideration of the rail interface things we talked about there is um, moving the position of the piles to avoid surcharge and rail all of these things can make life easier moving drainage away from the the railway as far as possible it makes life easier because you're safeguarding the railway which is what exactly what network rail wants and a key one for me is making sure that the site team have emergency contact details available for network rail on site and they know when to call them and how to call them and where they are more importantly where they are on the line so they can tell the signal or whoever